Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror and detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First Story Wendigo Encounter I've been debating on sharing this story with anyone outside of my small circle of people that were there. But I want to share my experience in hopes that it saves someone's life or to give understanding of what someone else has experienced. Late Fall 2010, in Northern Canada I went deep into the wilderness with my father and my eldest brother to hunt for moose. We left in the early morning just before sunrise trying to cover as much distance as possible before nightfall. We traveled winding rivers and had to repeatedly portage over rapids all day, we decided to set up camp just over halfway to our destination. My father figured that we'd make the rest of the journey tomorrow. Well, when everyone bedded down for the night, I decided to go grab some firewood and relieve myself down by the bank of the river, just out of reach of the light from the campfire. Out from the tree line, about 15 yards away, I could hear rustling in the bushes, I watched the area where I heard the noise and focused on that spot. I felt kind of funny, dizzy slash lightheaded, and I could smell this putrid stink, like old milk or rotten food. Then I saw the trees start to morph and move ever so slightly and began to take the shape of a head and slight facial features. My eyes began to adjust it to the darkness and along the tree line, I could hear this voice coming from there. I recognized it, the voice sounded like one of my relatives who had recently passed. The face took shape of my relative. Hello they said I've missed you. Come see me I smiled and stepped forward a bit but stopped to analyze the situation. My relative's face stopped smiling and became emotionless, the skin began to turn pale and peel away. Chunks of flesh from their cheeks began to fall away and I felt shock and fear overwhelm my body. I couldn't make sense of it at all so I started to back away and make my way to camp. I didn't realize at the time that I had been walking towards the voice and I was further away from the firelight. The voice became angry and began shouting at me to come here so I turned to run away but as I looked back one more time I saw the most disgusting thing I had ever seen, it was rotting flesh on gnawed bone, caved in eyes and a hollow chest cavity, this humanoid creature was tall and super thin. I ran as fast as I could trying to yell for help but the fear had made my voice quiet and raspy, I ran along the river bank and I could hear the heavy breaths and the stomping feet from this thing right behind me, I made it onto the top of the river bank but it grabbed a hold of my leg as I jumped up. I gripped and tore the grass trying to lift myself and yelled as loud as I could then finally my voice came back and I yelled that someone has my leg. My brother woke up and ran over to where I was then he pulled me up and took me over to the fire. I was terrified, trying to explain what I saw and that it looked like my relative but not. I was trying to convince them that I wasn't seeing things but my brother nodded his head and said I saw it too, I know. That solidified it, he acknowledged that it was real. We stayed up all night after that, rifles loaded and close by. We packed up when the sun was coming up and went back home. We haven't shared that story with anyone out of fear of being labeled as crazy or liars. I've had nightmares and couldn't sleep for months afterwards. I would see things slash dark figures looking into my window or hear whispers when I was walking home at night. Eventually, I was seeing this dark figure daily. I went to medicine men slash shaman for help but I've learned that the ceremonies only relieves it temporarily. Friends have given me everything from protection pouches to certain crystals. I found out that there's a strong possibility that I encountered a Wendigo. I learned that if you encounter one and survive, it attaches itself to you like a parasite. I learned that it could only do this if it touches you, which it did. Ever since that night, 
I've been on edge when I enter any forest or wooded area, which sucks because I loved being outdoors slash hunting and in nature. Now I always feel like I need to keep my back against something when I'm out in the wild. Anyways, make your own conclusions about this. I've paid a price for being an ignorant child to the stories of old. They are real, I can attest to that. Stay safe everyone. Second story. An encounter with a Wendigo. At one minute to midnight I took out the shot glass and put it beside the bottle of Jägermeister. I don't drink anymore after what happened to Pop. The one exception is the first day of September. The house is dark except for the warm glow of the three bulbs above the dining room table. I rub my tongue against the inside of my cheek. My mouth always goes dry. The only sound is the incessant ticking of the wall-mounted clock. At midnight the soft bell sounds, a miniature version of church bells. I fill the glass and hold it aloft for a second and swallow with a deep breath. The subtle burn winds its way into my throat and stomach. I wash the shot glass by the light of the moon shining through the kitchen window. Loretta wouldn't mind my drinking, but a used shot glass beside the sink raises questions. And I never like to talk about it. All these years later I still have nightmares. What I saw up on that mountain left a greater impression than any other event in my life. More than my children being born and my father drinking himself into an early grave. Loretta tells me I should talk about it. That it would help. She might be right. She always is. So here goes. I joined the park rangers service right out of school and it was a perfect fit. I took to academics like a fish to the desert and the outdoors always called. I passed my time in school daydreaming of the weekend and hiking or fly fishing with Pop. In the summer of 89, I was stationed in the Appalachians. Our jurisdiction encompassed trails leading all the way up the mountain. Up there the spruce thin out and clouds hang heavy even in fine weather at the base. I spent the summer clearing fallen branches from the walking trails after a couple of vicious storms over the winter. It was hack work reserved for the junior, but the truth of it was I didn't mind. The peak of the summer heat was spent and visitor numbers dropped as the weather began to turn. Persistent drizzle had kept me desk bound for the morning and we were about to get lunch when he burst through the door. He let out a moan and collapsed to the floor. Stanley leaned down and propped him in a seated position. Water dripped from his shoulder-length hair. His limbs hung limp by his side. I handed Stanley a cup of water. Stanley used his index finger to push down his chin. When the water hit his tongue the man tensed and his eyelids flicked open. He flailed his limbs and knocked the glass from Stanley's hand. The glass shattered on the floor, but the man paid it no mind. It is out there he said. What is? The man half turned and gripped Stanley's shirt and made balls with his fists. He repeated himself, pausing after each word. It is. Out. There. He started to sob. He released his grip on Stanley and buried his face in his hands. We lifted him onto a chair and he pressed his face against the table and bawled. I grabbed the rucksack he had dropped to the floor. On the bottom right was a name tag behind a plastic sleeve. Lenny Porter from San Diego. There was a number at the bottom. I'll make the call, Stanley said. When Stanley returned, Lenny was sat up staring blankly at the wall with red eyes. His face was gaunt, like he hadn't eaten in a week. Stanley closed the door. I spoke to your father. Lenny didn't acknowledge the words. He sat motionless and unblinking. 
Stanley shuffled across to where I was sitting and pressed his palms on the table. Lenny left San Diego two weeks ago with a couple of friends. They plan to spend a month hiking the trail north. The father gave me two names. Freddy and Sabrina. When he heard their names Lenny leaned over and picked up his backpack. He rummaged frantically until he pulled out a stack of Polaroids. He flicked through the photographs and then slapped one on the table. Stanley and I leaned over. Flanking a fitter and healthier Lenny were what must have been Freddy, tall and wearing a baseball cap, and Sabrina, shorter and wearing a bright yellow top with an almost fluorescent blue belt pulling the fabric tight around her waist. Lenny fingered the photo and tears welled in his eyes. What happened to them? He sobbed and shook his head. He opened his mouth to speak but no words came out. Stanley took a map down from the wall and pushed it in front of Lenny. We are here. Where did you last see them? Lenny blinked away tears and concentrated. He squinted at the map and pressed his index finger down and tapped it. Stanley took a pencil from his breast pocket and marked the map with a cross. I'll notify the police. Get the truck ready to go. During training they told us about search and rescue operations. The rangers are the first responders. It was part of the job. Twisted ankles and wandering off the trail and getting lost are not uncommon and no reason to get the police involved. But this felt different. I secured the gear in the truck and Stanley appeared, flanked by a police officer in his early thirties. Harry is hitching a ride. His partner will take care of Lenny. We drove up the trail for about 15 minutes with the truck until it grew too narrow and treacherous. We split up the gear between us and set out on foot. Our destination was high up the mountain and far away from the trails. It was almost as if the trails deliberately avoided the area. We hacked our way through the thick forest. How had they ended up all the way out here? Stanley checked his watch constantly as we climbed. He wanted to get there before dark. I figured we would be lucky if we did. Stanley and Harry talked like old friends, asking about each other's wives and children. The park rangers are in effect an extension of law enforcement. It made sense to be friendly with the police and living in a small mountain town made it almost inevitable. I like that. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Stanley checked the map. Almost there. Get your torches. All right. Harry reached into his backpack and pulled out a flashlight. I did the same. Do you know what's up this way? Stanley said. I shook my head. Somewhere up here is an old cabin. Hunters used it as a base back when you could still hunt up this way. The cross our friend Lenny put on the map is just about on top of it. Let's see if we can get there before there's no light left. We didn't make it by dark. Twilight gave to night with little warning. Soon we were relying on the light from our torches. Being on a trail in the sunshine lends a sense of security up here, even when you are alone. Now, surrounded by black and with the trail long behind us, an uneasiness grew in my stomach for the first time. Stanley paused and swept his torch. He muttered something under his breath. Harry took a few steps to the right, lowering his head and squinting. There it is, he said. At the farthest reaches of Harry's torchlight the cabin emerged from the woods. Stanley tapped Harry on the shoulder. My eyes aren't what they used to be. The cabin should have been a source of comfort, but it only added to my unease. The roof was half caved in and trees encroached on all sides, gnarled branches reaching out like fingers. The structure looked like it belonged more to the forest than to man. 
The only door hung askew on warped and rusted hinges. Two windows had long ago lost their glass. Stanley shouldered open the door with a grunt. Leaves and branches cover the floor, blown in through the open windows and roof. We dumped the gear inside. Stanley took out a lantern and tied it to a horizontal branch a few paces from the front door. He flicked it on and the light shone bright. If there was anyone lost nearby they could not fail to see it. We split up and entered the forest, guided by our torches. Stanley instructed us to go no further than the reach of the lantern. It was our lighthouse on the horizon. The wind blew in fresh from the north. I buttoned up my jacket against the cold. The beam from the torch was strong, but aside from the narrow cone of light, the forest was a deep and full dark. Stanley and Harry called out the names of the two missing, Freddy and Sabrina. I did the same. Every few steps I stopped and listened. The forest was alive with the scurrying of animals and insects going about their business and the constant rustling of the wind through the leaves. It was hopeless. This was needle in the haystack stuff. Freddy or Sabrina could be unconscious on the ground a few feet to my left and I would never see them. We should camp and wait for first light. Harry's voice cut through the night, louder and with urgency. I skipped towards the sound as fast as I dared. The two torchlights of Harry and Stanley played close together, the beams of light trained on the forest floor. You might not want to see this, Stanley said as I came up behind them. It was too late. By the light of the torches I saw him. Flat on his back, arms and legs bent at unnatural angles. I almost gagged when I saw his face. The left side caved in, a red, bloody mess fragmented with the white of the skull. The right side was intact, one green eye staring up, wide and unblinking. The remainder of the face had an almost serene expression. It was not the look of fear that you would expect from someone about to have half their face crushed. No skin remained below the neck, the contents of his torso picked so clean I could see his full spine. What did that? I stammered. I didn't get an answer. Stanley fished the Polaroid from his pocket and studied it under the torchlight. He handed it to Harry. It's him. It's Freddy. Harry jumped and swung his torch out into the woods. I swear I heard someone talking out there, Harry said. We've been calling out their names too. No, it wasn't that. It sounded like whispering. It's the wind through the trees. Harry didn't look convinced. He called out the name of Sabrina and listened. Only the sounds of the forest. Stanley shushed him. There's nothing we can do for the boy now. Let's get back to the cabin and radio down the news. Stanley took a few quick steps towards the cabin and motioned for us to follow. He seemed agitated. I didn't blame him. I followed on his heels. Harry lingered, searching the woods with his torch until he too fell in behind. The inside of the cabin felt like a sanctuary. Out of the wind and removed from the mangled corpse of Freddy, my mind processed the sight. I had gutted my fair share of fish, but this was different. I put my hand to my stomach and swallowed hard. I was overcome with a compulsion to repeat my unanswered question. What could have done that? Before I could, Harry gave us some more bad news. There was no response on the radio, only static. It wasn't surprising, the cabin sat in a depression between the peak we crested on our way in and the taller peak beyond. We have to go back, I said. Harry shook his head. Not in the dark and not when there's someone still out there. We don't know if that girl is dead or alive, Stanley said. I heard her. 
You heard a whisper is what you said. And if she was there she would have come to the light. She'll come to the lantern and we'll wait for her. Harry threw out his arms in protest. Stanley sighed. If she's dead then we'll find her in the light of morning. If she's alive and nearby enough to whisper in our ears then she'll come to us. Two rectangles of light shone through the open windows from the lantern outside, but the front room of the cabin still had dark shadowy corners. Stanley took a second lantern and tied it to an old light fixture hanging from the ceiling. The room lit up as if under sunlight, but a cold light that gave the room a bare and unwelcome feel. I busied myself clearing a space on the floor beside the black pot-belly stove at the rear of the room. Stanley and Harry stood as statues, staring up at the wall behind me. I turned. Etched in black soot onto the blank wall was some kind of monster. Long-limbed and with an elongated skull. It stared back at us through white blobs left clear of black. I took a step back and almost stumbled. What is that? I didn't need an answer. You don't live and work up in the mountains here without hearing the stories. Stories told dismissively by daylight, like you would talk about the monsters you imagined hiding in your closet as a kid. By night and around a campfire the stories take on a graver tone, and the name of the monster is only ever whispered. Wendigo. Of course I had never seen one. But if I had to imagine what one might look like, the painting in soot taking up the full height of the wall of the cabin was an exact match. I waited for one of the two men behind me to dismiss what we saw drawn on the wall. To make light of it and crack a joke. Neither did. Stanley uttered a simple instruction. No one goes outside without a weapon. Our shadows danced on the walls. The lantern hanging from the ceiling did not move. Stanley leaned and looked out the window. The lantern hanging from the tree branch swung back and forth like the pendulum of a grandfather clock. There was wind tonight, but not enough to do that. Stanley bent down and fished a rifle from the bag. My heart beat like a drum in my ears. And then something else. Whispers. What sounded like the whispers of a girl, entreating us inviting us out into the darkness of the forest. Stanley inched open the door with the muzzle of his rifle. He stepped through the gap and watched the lantern on the tree come to a rest. He stood beside the lantern and searched the corners of the forest illuminated by the light. Nothing moved. Harry unclipped the leather strap on his belt and drew a pistol and went to the doorway. I felt naked and exposed with my hands empty. I took a step backwards, the Wendigo drawn in soot looming large behind and burning a hole in the back of my head. A shadow flashed through the trees and Stanley swung the muzzle of the rifle and shot, the crack piercing the night. He raised the rifle to his shoulder and flicked it from side to side searching for movement. The lantern boobed up and down. With a rush a long-limbed creature dropped onto Stanley from above. He screamed and wrenched the rifle around, but had it knocked from his grip. Harry fired two shots and the creature let out a wail. It bound towards the door and Harry slammed it shut. He pointed the pistol to the closed door and emptied the chamber. Harry took a step back and shot me a glance. Through the whole ordeal I had not moved. I had barely breathed. Was it dead? Was Stanley okay? The window, I screamed. The long thin fingers of the creature wrapped themselves around the inside of the window frame. Then the head appeared, uncannily human-like but distorted and disfigured. The chin elongated and the teeth like razors and drenched in blood. Its eyes white and piercing. Just like the etching on the wall. Harry grabbed me by the arm and hauled me into the back room of the cabin. 
he slammed shut the flimsy door. The back room was windowless and the only light was a thin strip at the base from the lantern in the front room. We crouched together, our shoulders pressed against the door. We listened. The light patter of footsteps. Two thin strips of black interrupted the strip of light at the base of the door. Something stood on the other side. Come out, it is okay. It sounded like Stanley. Had he killed it? Come out. Harry straightened and I grabbed his shoulder. Don't open the door, I whispered. They say a Wendigo can imitate those it kills. My hand brushed against Harry's back and knocked the flashlight from his jacket pocket. I fumbled in the darkness until I found it and I flicked it on. I scanned the room for something, anything we could use as a weapon. I walked away from the door and kicked at the twigs and leaves on the floor. All that was good for was kindling. Something smelled rotten. There must be a dead rat somewhere. It's Stanley, Harry said. I pointed the torch to him. His eyes were wide and wild. He must have killed it. He smiled at me and took a step back. The door slammed open and carried with it the rotten stench. What stood in the doorway was not Stanley, but the Wendigo. Harry kneeled before it, breathing in the noxious fumes. I shone the torch onto the creature. Its gray skin pulled tight on a gaunt frame. And then something glinted. A belt buckle. Around the creature's waist was the bright blue belt Sabrina wore in the Polaroid. Sabrina? I said. It turned to me and paused, tilting its head to the side. I thought I saw a glimmer of recognition, a brief moment where it knew the name. But then it snarled, its mouth opening wide and dripping with saliva. It wrapped two hands around the neck of Harry and leaned in. I acted instinctively, without thinking. I jumped at the creature, swinging the only weapon I had, the torch. I brought it down on its head with all the strength and adrenaline I had. It bucked and sent me flying into the front room beyond. I threw out my hands against the fall and grabbed the lantern Stanley had hung from the ceiling. It could not bear my weight and the cord pulled out from the ceiling and I fell with a thud. I jumped up at a burst of warmth from my stomach. The lantern had smashed on impact and the white hot filament broke free of its casing. I groaned in pain and the creature lumbered forwards. I retreated into the corner of the room and pulled my knees up to my chest. It stood over me and opened its mouth, razor-sharp teeth gleaming white. Then the smell of smoke. The creature hopped and then scrambled backwards. The leaves and twigs covering the floor ignited under the heat from the lamp filament. A small flame burst up and the creature covered its face. Fire. It didn't like fire. I crawled forwards and swept as much of the kindling as I could grab onto the flames. The fire grew and the creature screamed. As smoke filled the room it coughed and spluttered. It made one last effort to come at me and then retreated out of the room and into the forest. I went to the back room and grabbed Harry. We stumbled out of the cabin, the fire now spreading up the walls into the roof. Stanley lay below the lantern hung from the tree, unmoving and with a chunk of flesh missing from his throat. We ran into the forest in the opposite direction the creature had gone. We first climbed up to the crest and then back down the mountain. We stumbled our way down by the light of the torch. Adrenaline coursed through our veins and we imagined that thing right behind us, stalking us in the dark. When we finally crossed a trail we followed it back down to the ranger station. A team of police and National Guard hiked up to the cabin after the sun rose. The cabin had burned to the ground, the pot-belly stove the only item that survived the blaze. 
the bodies of Stanley and Freddy were brought down. They said Stanley's flesh had been picked clean down to the skeleton. That was the first day of September, 1989. Sabrina was listed as a missing person and her father spent a month in the mountains searching for her. But she's gone in every sense that matters. Turned to a Wendigo by hunger for human flesh. She transformed into something unrecognizable from where it began. Around campfires people still tell stories of the Wendigo. I don't know if they truly believe they are out there. But I know, I have seen it. Sometimes there really is a monster in the closet. Third story. The mysterious life of a cryptid hunter. Now, before I explain my profession, let me tell the truth. There are monsters in the world, and they're almost all out for your blood. Luckily, there are people to keep them at bay, I am one of those people. Now, I'm long retired, for 15 years, but I've seen my fair share of blood, guts, demonic possession, and things with more teeth than normal. So, I'm here to give you an idea of the shit I've encountered. Okay, let's start with the basics. My dad was a cryptid hunter. The top of his class, actually. He has probably seen way more than I have. He specialized in long-range type missions, many of which occurred in forested areas. But, he also tackled some more, close range for lack of a better word, missions. He's killed things from ancient werewolves worshipped by Indians to the mighty mothmen of Point Pleasant. He's tough, but the things he couldn't kill were known as specialized cases. These were monsters that had brains, or hadn't done anything wrong at that point, or monsters that the government just wanted them to be kept alive for one reason or another. One of these cases was a girl named Emily, but we'll get to her later. For now, let's talk about my stories of woe. My name is Tom, I'm 36. I was chosen for this job because of my connection with the military, combined with my dad's friends knowing me, I was in. But, questionable hiring aside, my first case was simple, a chupacabra had been killing sheep and attacked a farmer, we were worried that it might develop a taste for human flesh. So, they sent me to a ranch in the middle of nowhere, Mexico. Now, chupacabra are a bitch to catch but they're a walk in the park compared to some other cryptids. It required a weird cycle of putting out half-rotted sheep meat, and waiting. I repeated this for days, but finally it came. I first saw it sniffing the fly-covered sheep meat, and I readied my sniper rifle. Just as I was about to pull the trigger, it saw me, and leaped almost directly on top of me. It had at least jumped a good 20 feet forwards and 10 feet high. It clawed my arm up, but I grabbed my trench knife and sunk it into the beast's left shoulder. It recoiled and roared in agony, less of a roar, more of a human scream mixed with a cougar. I drew a shotgun out from a backpack I carried, and blew its head off. I got up, wrapped my bloody arm in bandages and loaded the corpse into my car, and drove away. When I got back, it was discovered that other hunters had caught another cryptid, a girl named Emily. Emily looked, for what I could tell, completely human, but she had something that was up with her. Despite looking eight years old Max, black long hair, brown eyes, she could solve math problems near instantly, like I'm talking seven digit number multiplication in at most two seconds. She talked like she was in a professional meeting with the president of the U.S. She appeared to have no feelings besides hatred. I was tasked with guarding the interviewer in her cell. The conversation goes as followed. Interviewer, good evening, Emily. Emily, good evening, sir. Interviewer, need anything before we continue? Emily, no, sir. I'm fine. Interviewer, what do you feel right now, what do you see? Emily, looks around room I see everything. 
I see the fear in your eyes. I see the clock ticking to 10.50 p.m. And I see the evil in him. Points at me. Interviewer, okay, what do you feel? Emily, must I really answer that when I've taken thousands of lives because of it? This girl had killed over 2,000 people before her capture, and I was in the same room with this monster. But, she still looked completely human, when I noticed her eyes. Her eyes weren't normal, they seemed to look normal one second, but then expanded into nothing but a black void the other second, eyes of hatred, eyes of a desire to kill everyone and everything. Then she grew, she went from an eight-year-old to my age. 21, in an instant. My grip on my handgun tightened. Emily, sir, please step out of the room, I don't want to hurt someone like you. Interviewer, wait don't leave. His plea was silenced when Emily lunged from her seat, she drew a small knife from one of her boots she was wearing, and plunged it into the man's eye socket, he screamed and I fired my gun. It hit her point blank in the side but she shook it off. I bolted out of there, shutting the door and securing the three locks on the door, and alerted the guards. My boss came. He said that because of how dangerous Emily is, they can't risk any more people. So, they left the man there and gave me my next mission. My next mission was to find a cryptid known only as Codename, Pale. Codename, Pale is a ten-foot pale being with no defining features on its face save a big bloodshot eye in the center. Its agenda is mostly unknown and what is known is classified information. But, what differs it from other cryptids is that it has the uncanny ability to read the minds of its victims, understand the human mind, and even learn sign language apparently when it escaped. So, I get in my car find the coordinates of where it was last spotted this time being somewhere in Arizona, and haul ass to that spot. Fucker was still there sitting on a tree stump, waiting. I snuck through the bushes, loaded my shotgun, and took aim. I know you want to kill me, Tom. I know you're there, come out of your spot. The voice, oh god the voice. It sounded like a man speaking through a microphone. It echoed when there was no possible way for it to echo. I spoke. Me, you know that I'm here to kill you? Pale, you pick up hints when you're sitting on a tree stump, enjoying the Arizona night, then someone in a loud-ass truck hauling ass up the hill towards you gets out with a shotgun and hides in the bushes. He was joking around. He knew where on the map he was. He knew what cars and guns are. He could swear. This pale was no ordinary cryptid, he knew his way, he understood the concept of human interaction. I questioned him. Me, how did you understand that you were going to die, and joke about it all while staring death in the face? Pale, my friend, you're not death. Me, but you're going to die by my hand, doesn't that make me death in this situation? Pale, neither of us are death, death is its own thing. Think of death as a disease that slowly eats away at your life. You can either spread it, or keep it for yourself. Either way, you and I are going to die. Those who are affected by death are not death itself. Me, but, you're going to die, death spreads death. The Grim Reaper spreads death and therefore is death. If the act of spreading death makes you death, I am death. Pale, those who are affected by death are not death itself. Me, sorry, pale. This talk was fun but I gotta kill you. Pale, very well. This entity was quite the Aristotle. I took aim and shot him in the chest. Pale went down. I got him and drove him back to my headquarters and, was given my next mission the next week. The mission was to find a Bigfoot, yes a Bigfoot, not the Bigfoot, that killed at least 200 people in a forest in Canada. 
I flew there and after a week, found my perfect spot near a big ass cave near where the sightings were most frequent. I waited days, surviving off of granola bars and water. But, I saw him walk out of the cave on a Tuesday afternoon, I was munching on my 50th granola bar that day, he noticed me in the bushes, the last thing I saw before bolting for better cover was a good 500 pound boulder barreling towards me. I basically jumped from my spot into a thicket of trees and began running. You would believe that he was at least somewhat affected by the trees and to that, I envy you. As I was dodging trees and getting ripped up by thorn bushes, he was smashing through the trees, enduring crotch shots that would make even my dad weep in pain. I spun around quickly and fired a shot with my sniper rifle. It sliced through his left shoulder, drawing blood. But he slammed me into the side with his long monkey arms. I crashed through at least 20 feet worth of trees, I slammed into the ground with a sickening crunch as my ribs cracked. By the time I was up, he was running at me again, I knew that I can't outrun him, I drew my knife and rushed him, sinking it into his side, he roared in rage and agony. I put my sniper rifle to his head and fired. The beast fell, he was eight feet tall, so when he fell, he rumbled the ground a bit. Like always, I packed him into the car, and drove away. After I got him to my boss, I got a strange request from the guards that guard the cells that contain the specialized cases, it was a note from Emily, she said how she wanted me moved to that guard duty. Naturally, it was sent right to me before anything bad happened. I walked to Emily's cell, she greeted me with a hello and I repeated the greeting. She asked so that I was in the room with her, heavily guarded, of course. She spoke. Emily, you know how I said you're evil? Me, the only evil person evil here is you. Emily, cold, direct, and correct. I'm impressed. Me, why did you bring me here? Emily, quite simple. I brought you here so that I can show you one my abilities other than shapeshifting. Me, trying to break the tension, is that a monster's way of flirting? Emily, negative, I'm here to say that I have more abilities. All of a sudden, one of the guards heads explodes out of nowhere. Me, Jesus Christ. What the hell was that? Emily, it was not of my doing. Look. I turned around, and saw a horrifying sight. The guard had been shot. Soldiers were raiding the area. Me, what? He's dead. What do we do? Other guard dies. Emily, I suggest that we make a run for it, even though I can hold my own. I don't want a person like you to die. Me, okay, but stay the fuck close. I don't want you to go around killing people. So here I was, sneaking my way through a monster prison with a girl that killed almost 2,000 people right behind me, all while military personnel are raiding the building. This couldn't get any worse, can it? Well, as it goes, it did. We were in the second wing of the building, only one wing away from the exit, when a mothman jumped me. It bit down hard on my shoulder, causing me to shriek in pain, I drew my knife and shoved the blade into its torso. It screamed, and got off me, before crashing through a glass cell holding a goat man, which proceeded to charge out of instinct, straight into Emily's path. Before I could speak, the goat man, or what was left of him, was splat against the wall, Emily stood there, holding a nearby pair of scissors. It took me a while to realize that what was splat against the wall was its brain, Emily had gutted the poor bastard like a fish and had enough time to perform extreme brain surgery. I got up, nice job I said. After that, we booked it to the exit. Now, came the hard part, what to do with Emily. She didn't seem like the cold monster she was in the facility. 
she was glad, happy even, to be in the outside world, yet, five seconds ago, she gutted a goat man faster than a ninja in an anime can slice something mid-air. When I questioned her about it later, she said that she was the last surviving subject of a failed attempt to make a super soldier. Think, a soldier with the highest rank in military, experience with guns, knows almost every form of martial arts, and with the speed and agility of a methed up chipmunk. Now, multiply that by 100, give them shape-shifting abilities, and you get close to Emily's capabilities. Turns out, she means well, has an IQ of almost 200, and can tell if someone asking her questions is a spy. She had been hunted down by the military since she escaped the facility at 8 years old. And the highest kill count? All military personnel. The monster hunters had to capture her so that the public won't find out about her backstory. Pretty cool. Also, she was cool with the facility keeping her, although she said it could get a bit stuffy, all in that cold, matter-of-fact tone. Cut to two months later, me, Emily, and my best friend turned monster hunter Josh were in the Alaskan wilderness, tracking down a yeti. And before you ask, yes. There is a difference between a Bigfoot and a yeti. For starters, a yeti is much taller. Like, Bigfoot can only be 8 feet tall. However, there are reports of yetis becoming a staggering 26 feet in height. So, needless to say, we asked for some heavy-duty tools. The next difference is their behavior. While Bigfoot only attack when provoked or their territory is invaded, yetis could wipe out entire villages without even waking up on the wrong side of their rock bed. So, we were tracking this thing down in the snow. I was scouting out the area when Josh asked. Josh, so, Tom, how's Emily? Me, just as murderous as always. Josh, being the shit-talking douche he is, I've been seeing you two exchange glances. Me, remember, Josh. You're not the one here with the high-powered sniper rifle. Josh, oh come on, man. It was just a prank. Me, also knowing how Josh loves pranks that cause a lot of damage, you said that when you egged my car. Josh, I'll fuggin' do it again. Our banter was cut short via a roar so loud it seemed to rumble the ground beneath our feet. Followed by a tree hurling towards us like a wooden torpedo. I heard Emily scream get down, as it crashed into the ground, nearly connecting with my head. Then silence, I sat up and looked through the scope of my rifle. I saw the Yeti crashing through the trees making a beeline for us. I fired a shot, which whistled through the air and hit the beast in the kneecap. It roared in pain, but kept its pace. We slid down into a frozen creek, and kept low. Josh was breathing heavily, but kept his cool, somehow. I was keeping a straight face, something I'm really good at. Hell, the other hunters gave me the nickname Poker Face for that reason. Emily was same, but less relaxed than me. She was gripping her shotgun tightly. I held my breath. The monster was right where we wanted it. I hesitated, the Yeti was sniffing around getting increasingly closer to our position. It grabbed Josh, swung him into a tree. The crack of Josh hitting the tree is in my mind forever. Emily shot him in the chest, ran up to the rock, jumped from it, and nailed the 19-foot behemoth in the head with a well-placed tornado kick. But it slammed her into the ground. I fired again, it sliced through the side of his neck. He saw where the bullet came from, and nearly pulverized me with his hand. I rolled out of the way just in time, but he backhanded me into a tree. The sickening feeling of my ribs cracking almost made me throw up. The Yeti walked up, picked me up by my head, 
and sat. The beast could crack my skull like an overripe blueberry. I stopped moving, body frozen in fear. When Josh fished out the Molotov cocktails in his pack and tossed one onto the eddy, it went up in flames, screaming. It dropped me into the creek, breaking the ice, causing my poor back to come into contact with freezing water and the rocky bottom of the creek at the same time. The monster crashed to the ground, a burning turd of what was once a yeti. Still wallowing in pain, I opened my eyes to see Emily. She was staring at me, pale. Are you okay, Tom, she said. I nearly jumped if it wasn't from the pain. She had asked a question with genuine concern for my safety. This is not the Emily I once knew. I just sat there, looking. What, are you in too much pain to speak, she said. I snapped back to reality and said no, I'm just surprised you just asked me that. But, deep deep down, her question confused me, not for the actual question itself, but how she said it. After informing my boss about the situation, he said that I should get well soon a pretty mundane type of response. But, knowing my boss and his love for underlying meanings, I pressured him about it. He said this. Boss, there is another cryptid in Alaska. Me, is it another Yeti? Boss, no, it's something way worse. Me, okay, like how worse? Boss, it's a Wendigo. A Wendigo. In Alaska. The perfect bitch slap of fate to ruin my day. If you didn't know, Wendigos are some of the most deadly cryptids out there. They're fast, mean, and don't go down without a fight. How do I know this? My dad was tasked with killing a baby version of these bastards. Only about six feet tall, three times smaller than an adult. And it almost killed him. He was able to give it a lethal dose of cyanide, via the Wendigo killers Wendigos eat almost anything, so it would eat a bottle filled with weird liquid by shoving it in its mouth, and pumping three slugs into the beast's brain. And that was only the baby. Okay, so it turns out that there wasn't just us hunting this thing down, three other people were sent to go with us to hunt this thing. We were in a military-esque car driving through the forest of Alaska, on the outskirts of a small village. I was riding shotgun, a hunter named Mike was driving, Emily and Josh were in the second row of seats, and two other hunters, two males, Jaden and Bob, were riding in third row. Mike, you know what a Wendigo looks like? Me, ah, uh, I've seen them in the manual. Mike, don't worry, you'll know, deer-like head, very thin, roughly six meters, very scruffy fur that hangs from its body. Emily, sounds a lot like a skinwalker. Mike, yeah, they're pretty similar. But, a skinwalker is a calm, calculating hunter with an attitude, as well as shape-shifting abilities that evolve from corrupted shamans, a wendigo is a cannibalistic, savage beast with an attitude, that evolves from some twat eating human flesh. It was about 10 o'clock at night. We were driving at a normal pace when Mike stopped. Hey, why did the car stop, said Josh. Mike slowly pointed in front of him. We all looked, and froze with him. There, seemed to be what looked like a mangled deer carcass sitting straight up. One issue, however, it was too big to be a deer. Slowly, it rose up from its crouching position, its arms hung low, to its knees. Its fur was snarled, and scruffy. Its horns were caked with blood. Along with the beast's snout, hands, and at its feet. We had just interrupted a Wendigo midway through his snack. The person was still moaning, and occasionally convulsing on the ground. The Wendigo's eyes adjusted to the light, and a wide, toothy smile slowly came upon its face. 
It licked its lips, it got ready to pounce. Just as the Wendigo was about to jump onto the car, Mike gunned it. Slamming straight into the beast's body. The Wendigo rolled over the car, its bones creating a stomach-turning squeaking noise as it did. We left it in the dust, supposedly. Five seconds later it was bounding towards the car, roaring. I stuck my head out of the window, and fired my assault rifle, several rounds tore through the beast's skin, but it just screeched and continued bounding after us. Josh dropped one of his cocktails, lighting up the ground behind us. The Wendigo leaped over the twelve-foot-high flames, and was able to slash the back tire of our car. Me, okay, this isn't part of the plan right? Mike, no. It is not. Jaden, I got a double action shotgun, it could do some damage. Mike, right, what do we need you to do to be able to hit it? Jaden, I gotta get close. Emily, I can help with that. Mike, what can SHE do that we can't? Me, you'll be surprised, Mike. Mike, okay fine. Just get this damn thing off my tail. Jaden leaned out of the car. I readied my assault rifle for another barrage of bullets to be sent the Wendigo's way. Emily drew a barbed wired whip. I watched with wide eyes as Emily snagged the Wendigo's right leg. It fell and got dragged. Still roaring and slashing, the Wendigo batted Emily off. Emily got tangled in the barb and almost fell on top of the monster. I grabbed a part of the whip. My hand got snagged on the barb. I bared through the pain, and pulled Emily, and the Wendigo closer to the truck. Jaden took aim. But, out of nowhere, the Wendigo slashed another tire. The truck spun out, and crashed. I remember waking up, I crawled out of the mangle of metal that was once a truck. I dragged Josh, Mike. Jaden, and Bob out, one missing, Emily. I got to her, her torso was cut up by the barbs, her breathing was labored, and she was bleeding. I got her out. When all of a sudden, the Wendigo jumped out. Jaden pumped a slug into its left eye socket, destroying most of its head. It roared in pain, but batted Jaden away. Mike shot it in the stomach with his revolver, it once again batted him away. Bob shot it with his crossbow, but he got slashed away. While we were in bad shape, the Wendigo was dying. Its breathing was fast and shallow, its body was riddled with burns, gunshot wounds, and arrows. Finally, it dropped, its breathing becoming even more fast and labored. Josh grabbed one of his Molotov cocktails, and shoved it into his mouth. The beast gulped and exploded. Its chest burst from the pressure and flames. It screamed, but its screams were different. Sounding more human than normal. After watching the light show that was that, I went to care for Emily, I gently unwrapped the barb, bandaged her up, and made sure she drank some water. The Wendigo was still breathing, but it was fading. We all gathered round, and watched this monster. To think, that this was once a human, was chilling. A person resorting to the most extreme and desperate measures in order to survive. Mike handed me his revolver. I nodded, I knew what to do. I limped up to the heaving beast, just barely clinging onto life and put a bullet in its head. But, as its eyes slowly closed shut, I saw its eyes shift from rage, to confusion, to realization, to panic, to denial, every single human emotion in its most raw and desperate form flashed through its eyes, something I've always ignored because I was too busy thinking about the rush killing these things gave me. And, finally, its eyes turned into acceptance, then blank. In the final moments of its life, the Wendigo had found out that it was going to die, 
felt every emotion from anger to guilt about all the people it killed, and died accepting that it was going to die a monster in the eyes of everyone it ever knew and loved. And to be that desperate to accept and come to a conclusion like that, I couldn't handle it. I burst into tears, sobbing, screaming, I dropped to my knees. This monster found peace at the final moments of its life, and knew full well that it was the last time it would ever feel those feelings. I started crying even harder. Everyone else wasn't doing very well either, they had all picked up on the signals about the poor Wendigo. Jaden was in shock, Bob was in a similar state, Josh was crying with me. But the worst was Mike's and Emily's expressions. Mike, a 65-year-old battle-hardened hunter, had tears running down his face. But Emily, Emily, same age as me, she was the worst to look at. While everyone else wasn't trying to hide their emotions, Emily was trying her absolute hardest. She was nearly choking from her attempts to hold in her sadness. But, it broke into these guttural, painful sobs. Emily, the coldest person I know, was crying along with everyone else. But, something inside her changed that night. As if she knew all the pain she caused. She walked up, and hugged me tightly. Everything will be alright, she said, and she kissed my forehead. By the time I had really come to realize what happened, I was still sobbing. But, I got up, walked Emily with everyone else to the mangled thing that was supposed to be a car, and questioned her about it on our way back. Me, why did you kiss me? Emily, well, my entire life was filled with hatred. I hated everyone and everything. But, when you got me out of the facility instead of leaving me alone, something clicked. I knew what it was like to love. Jaden, Mike, and Bob, a Josh, amidst the awing, called it. Cut forward to now. Emily and I are happily married. Josh is a chemist, Mike is a happy, healthy, 80-year-old coot. And lives in a nursing home me and Emily occasionally visit, Jaden is my age, and is an engineer, Bob is about 11 years older than me, and he's in IT, Emily is a therapist for a big company, and I'm a zoologist studying species of animals. Things are going great. I hope you enjoyed my story. But, I gotta go. I gotta feed my cat. Fourth story. It was not a Wendigo. So today me and my friend, we'll call Haven for the story, went out into the woods as promised. We had not brought a Ouija board though. Haven knows all about my messed up relationship with the otherworldly. But what happened today has me wondering if I'll even wake up tomorrow. So the night before we decide to do this my ma tells me something I didn't know one day my pa in a drunken fit goes deep into the woods and to his horror he finds mangled carcasses of coyotes, deer, and even a bear. I knew this wasn't some normal predator, and I just knew something would go wrong if we tried this, but I brushed it off. So me and Haven were walking home from school, I live 30 minutes away from it, and we started talking about what we think will happen. I honestly didn't think a damn thing about IT.AS we neared our location the air became, thin. The old abandoned cabin that the skeletons were found had a metal road block, making it hard to exit or enter, which proved to be a nightmare. Possible trigger suicide mention not graphic just the word, my friend Haven wasn't getting not ifs from her phone anymore and apparently her gram had called. About a month ago Haven attempted suicide, but she's still here and doing much better. Her gram from North Dakota called to make sure she was alright and we were by this cabin. Before she had called H had asked do you really think it's a Wendigo, like why attack this little town? 
Like I said I'm part Native American and in this culture we're not supposed to talk about skinwalkers or the gain interest in us. I explained this to her and said the following, no, I believe it is actually a skinwalker since I talk about them so much it would make sense as to why they'd come for me. She then called her gram back while on the phone I pointed out how there was no other sign of life. My house is just down the road from hers and all you hear is birds, but it was dead silent. And this is where I can't even believe what happened. I have always had quite a bit of underdeveloped psychic ability. Like I'll see glimpses of the future and they'll come true unless I change something I'm doing all of a sudden just as her gram starts tell her she loves her it started breaking into this garbled static of screams and howls and I panicked. I saw a glimpse, there were two skinwalkers behind us quite far away but I knew if we waited any longer, we'd die. I grabbed her hand and sprinted as fast as possible I heard something behind us, all the while the garbled static continued, I'll try to find a clip or something of what it kind of sounded like it'll be at the bottom of the post, and then her phone died just as we cleared the roadblock and bolted for my grandma's. She wasn't home just the dog. We locked all the doors and just hid. The dog will not stop whimpering and barking at this point we're both in tears then we hear someone pull in. And then nothing else really happens we just go home. I will never forget that sound. If you've ever seen Mr. Nightmare's video with the down under the bed story, those garbled screams are almost exactly what we heard. Fifth story. The Wendigo became my friend. I visited my parents' cabin by the lake months ago. It's not something I like to talk about. I lost some friends up there, gained one very important friend. A mentor, you could say. And I had every intention of having a fun, carefree trip. Fuck. I guess in some ways I did. So many memories in such a short period of time too. The sweet smells of people I never noticed before. You go by most people and what do you smell? Some bullshit old spice or axe spray of some loser trying to pick up a girl. But humans are so much more than these modern smells. They can smell like pine trees, fear and hatred, confusion and complete terror. There's a whole universe of sweet smells out there that most people miss. I didn't discover this until my trip to the lake. For the first day, everything went like I expected. My girlfriend and a couple of friends were having fun hiking and camping out. We were all having a blast until the rainstorm hit. I've never seen so much rain in my life. It came down in sheets and we barely made it back to the cabin. Kevin tripped and fell. Bobby yelped and said he wanted to go home. My girlfriend made it back to the cabin first. She held the door open for everyone else. Once inside, we made sure all the windows were locked to prevent water from coming in. Trouble was, the roof started to leak. We lit candles because there was no electricity. Fuck, Kevin said. We're all going to drown. Calm down, Kevin, my girlfriend replied. It will take months for the cabin to fill up at this rate. We're going to be fine. Kevin was completely right, except water wouldn't be his demise. Bobby didn't say much. He looked like a scared child in his corner, and he leaned forward on a rickety chair, biting his nails. We were all lost in our own thoughts. Especially me, I think. I was having thoughts I had never experienced before, thoughts of, devouring. Of devouring everyone in the room in a rush of blood and destruction of the flesh. I even started to look at my girlfriend that way, which worried me. They were all trapped here, my girlfriend, Bobby, and Kevin. The rain was coming down even harder, and this little group had nowhere to go. They were completely at my mercy, and I couldn't be happier about this fact, of course one had to be strategic. 
I told them I was tired from the ride up here. I got up, kissed my girlfriend on the cheek and went to my room. It was the largest in the cabin, and I had it all to myself. As I lay in bed, I felt something deliciously dark take over. I knew without having to confirm with some meaningless scientific instrument the Wendigo inhabited the room along with me. Hello, Jason. How are you feeling today? The Wendigo asked. Its voice was gravelly, a little off-kilter. Okay, I responded. A little down. Could it be that you have a craving for flesh? I thought about his question. Like, really thought about it. Some philosophers considered suicide to be the greatest philosophical question, but I disagreed. The human action most on my mind was whether or not to rend flesh from bone. The horn thing stared at me from across the room with piercing hollow eye sockets. I felt a feeling which seemed so lush and dangerous that I knew it wasn't good for me. I knew civilization was a sham, an abyss of houses, roads, and stop signs layered with bureaucracy and hazy ambitions to reach its peak. Illusions I'm glad you've come to see the light, the Wendigo said. I stood up, joints stiff, head swimming, but not in a bad way, in a pleasant undrunk and shouldn't be driving sort of way. What happened next I don't really like to talk about. It felt good though. I killed Kevin out back with an axe he used for chopping wood. And Bobby? Death by kitchen knife. I ate them both. I picked their bones clean, leaving them so bare and white you could put them on display in a museum. My girlfriend looked at me with such unbelievable horror that I knew I couldn't devour her like I did Kevin and Bobby. I ran away into the woods. I've killed and devoured so many things in the wilderness that I've lost count. After the cabin massacre, I lived in a cave in the woods for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. The Wendigo would visit me, tell me tales of days long gone. I'd stare into its hollow eyes, get a fuzzy feeling, and I'd have to go on the hunt again. So for a while, the Wendigo became my friend. I was sad and deflated when it was all over. I'm back in the abyss of houses again, trying to think of an ambition that would excite me as much as what I did in the woods that day. Nothing yet. There's not even the thrill of getting caught. I know the Wendigo will protect me, erase any evidence of my dirty deeds. I have faith in that. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comment section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.